One of the end goals for structural health monitoring is that we want to make timely and cost-effective maintenance decisions. Now, commonly, this is a challenging problem because of the large number of structural elements in each bridge or like in the network in general that coincides with a large number of decisions that needs to be taken simultaneously each year. So, for example, these decisions could be whether or not to maintain um, a bridge or a structural element or what kind of maintenance that we need to apply. So in today's talk, uh, I'm going to uh, show like how we can leverage some of the advantages of uh, reinforcement learning in order to use it for uh, maintenance planning uh, on bridges. Uh, my name is Zachary and uh, the title of this talk is uh, carries the name of a, a recent paper that has been accepted in the Journal of Reliability Engineering and uh, System Safety. So to start this talk, uh, first we let's. Uh, this is an overview for the presentation. So first, I'm gonna cover. Uh, I'm gonna provide a little bit of recap where we're gonna have a look at the database that I'm working with, some of its properties, and our objectives in working with this uh, database. After that, uh, I'm gonna uh, present um, uh, Infra Planner, which is uh, an environment for emulating the deterioration uh, behavior of infrastructure. This is part of the uh, recent developments that we've done in this research work. This is uh, followed by some of the theoretical concepts that constitute the decision-making framework that we've developed uh, in this study. And then toward the end, we're going to see some of the analysis and results that we've obtained using the developed uh, framework. So uh, to start with, uh, the context that we are working with is the context of visual inspections. And visual inspections is a network scale monitoring approach. So by a network, we're referring to a number of bridges. So in our case, we have around 10,000 bridges in the, uh, pr within the province of Quebec. Some of these bridges could be similar to each other in terms of type, material, location, or, and some of them are completely different. Now, in order to understand how visual inspections are performed, we need to know what's within each bridge. So the hierarchy of uh, the data or the bridge, uh, the information in the bridge uh, is, uh, goes as follows. So first we have, uh, for each bridge, we have two types of uh, structural elements. One type is uh, for structural elements that correspond to or responsible for the structural safety of the bridge, such as the beams, the slabs, and so on. While the other uh, type of structural elements is the, the, uh, the elements that determine the level of serviceability of the bridge such as the barriers and the pavement components. So these are structural categories and within each structural category, we have a number of structural elements. So for example, for one bridge, we could have uh, two or three slabs and so on for the rest of the structural categories. Now, visual inspections are performed at the element level. So at a given year, for example, 2008, we have uh, the inspectors would perform visual inspections, not only on one element, but actually on all the elements within a given bridge. Now, visual inspections happen every three or two years, depending on the importance of the bridge. So we would have another round of inspections in the year 2011, for, for example, in this case, uh, and so on. So in addition to visual inspections, we have also information about the interventions. So we know what type of intervention that took place and we know when it did take place. So for example, here we have interventions that happened on the slabs. And then after that, the visual inspections would carry on as usual. So the first part of the project have focused on an element level. So for element level modeling on, based on visual inspection data, we can see here in this example, so here we have uh, two graphs. The, gra the graph on the left where we have the uh, conditions. So we have on the x-axis is the timeline on a yearly scale. 
and the y-axis we have the condition where 100 means perfect condition and 25 is the worst condition here the axis is truncated for uh, visibility for improving the visibility now the inspection data or the visual inspection data is represented by the blue points where each point is associated with an inspector and now you see that here in this case we have different inspectors over time because they have different uh, id numbers now in this case uh, the the we can see that the visual inspections indicate that there is no change in the deterioration condition of the structure element however um, uh, because of the and this mainly can be attributed to the inspector's uncertainty now quantifying the inspector uncertainty is, has been done in a previous work uh, uh, that we've had and if we see that the uncertainty or, or uh, and the bias for each inspection point is represented by the uh, cyan color and the vertical blue points for the uncertainty around each uh, inspection point now if we want to plot the uh, deterioration model we can see that uh, the uh, deterioration model represented by the red dashed line for the median and the confidence interval uh, for one and two standard deviation of our uh, condition and same thing for our deterioration speed where we have the median and the confidence interval ar around it and this is like over time for the next uh, few years so this is uh, really a recap from a previous work uh, and this is an analysis on an element level so obtaining the element level deterioration uh, this is again from previous work uh, we can actually uh, from this uh, element level deterioration we can aggregate these deterioration estimates to obtain the overall deterioration condition for the uh, the slabs or like the overall deterioration speed as well and the same thing up to the bridge so it's possible to aggregate the deterioration state estimates to obtain the overall deterioration state for the bridge and the overall uh, which include the condition and the speed so this is like really an overview for uh, the deterioration analysis now what we want to do is that we want to actually use this information for decision making now the first step to do so is to develop uh, an environment for emulating the deterioration process so this environment would carry the same theoretical foundations that we had in the deterioration model and we're going to use it in order to uh, uh, to test or explore uh, maintenance policies after that uh, the step two would be to formulate uh, a framework for planning maintenance uh, on bridges so like for uh, that would actually use the environment that we we've developed and we're gonna go through uh, the uh, the framework details in later sections and then we're going to see that the framework and the environment that uh, we've developed, uh, we've actually used it to uh, perform uh, deterioration and intervention analysis on a bridge within the uh, Quebec province. So let's start uh, with the first part. Uh, we'll talk about the uh, environment for emulating the deterioration process. So what when I say an environment, we're talking about uh, uh, that uh, a, an environment for simulating or again emulating the deterioration process so given the state of my structure structure or like my structure element if we want to simplify the problem at time t what i want is that i want to uh, say i want to take an action this action could be do nothing which means that i would let the element deteriorate or it could be maintain the structure element so my environment should take an action and what it should return it should return the next state so i was at time t after taking the action i would go to time t plus one so i would see the effect of the action whether it is to let the element deteriorate or by taking maintenance action where we could see a jump in the in the condition and the speed and also the environment should return the cost. So for example, if I did a maintenance action 
what is the cost associated with that uh, maintenance uh, maintenance action or if i didn't take a maintenance action where when i should have taken a maintenance action what is the penalty that would be imposed on me as a decision maker so this is basically the principle or the main ingredients for a, 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 an environment now the the theoretical or the the uh, foundations for for such a, a, an environment are really based on the deterioration model that we've developed previously which is based on a, a kinematic model so uh, this kinematic model if we want to start with uh, we have our kinematic equations for the conditions speed and acceleration these are well known uh, kinematic equations. Now we can write these equations in a matrix form. So as you, so as you see here, we have the vector here x t, which is composed of the condition x dot the speed and x double dot the acceleration, and the transition matrix a and x t minus one, which is the state at time t minus one and w t. So this is like really a normal kinematic model. And we want to see like the uh, method that would enable us to use this kinematic model for uh, um, uh, modeling the deterioration is really state space models. Now this uh, method is composed of transition model, which is exactly the kinematic model that we see here uh, on top which is composed of the state at time t equals to the uh, transition matrix multiplied by the state at time t minus 1 plus wt, which is the process error. Now, the process error described by a normal distribution with a zero mean and covariance matrix qt. Now, in order to have uh, some intuition about how does this work, so we'd imagine that I have the little graph here. On the x-axis, I have the time. On the y-axis, I have the condition. I started from a prior state, prior knowledge about like what it could be the condition. I can use my transition model described by this equation to obtain the state or my condition at time uh, t equals 1. Now, if I have an inspection point or if I have an observation on, on the condition, I need a model that would enable me to update my estimate of the condition at time t equals 1 with this new inspection. So that model would be the observation model and state space models, where yt is the observation equals to c, the observation matrix, multiplied by xt, the state at time t, plus vt, which is the observation error. Now the observation error is special in this case, because the observation error is really the inspector error in evaluating the condition of the structure element. So that error includes two components. Uh, we have the mean, so it's not a zero mean. We would have a mean value, which is the bias. And we would have also a variance, which is described like the, the magnitude of the error around that uh, mean. So. Uh, basically, these are model parameters that are uh, estimated based on the entire inspection database that we have. And again, these are things that are done uh, in previous work. So using this observation model, I can update my state to accommodate the information from the observation. And then after that, I can actually use my uh, uh, my transition model to predict the next state and if i have an inspection i can again update my uh, my uh, state estimate based on the information from that observation so all these operations can be performed using uh, or using the equations of the Kalman filter as a basic framework or as the basis framework to perform these operations now however there are some other uh, some some other factors that we took into account when modeling the deterioration but these are really the basic principles to describe the deterioration behavior now to use uh, this model within 
uh, a context of an environment that would emulate the uh, deterioration we can see that like on this little window on in the environment we can see on the x-axis we have the timeline on a yearly scale and on the y-axis we have the condition I can use my transition model again to go over time from 2013, 2014, and 2015. So this, this represent this would represent for my environment the true state, the true state of deterioration. I would assume that in this case I, I would know it. And then if I say like okay at 2016 I want to perform an intervention. After that I can actually. Uh, uh, perform this intervention I can have a jump in my condition as you'll see here and this uh, jump I can carry forward uh, in time using the same transition model and I can carry forward uh, estimating the uh, or, or actually propagating the true state now based on this uh, true state if I want to have uncertainty uh, about my condition, I can actually sample inspection data. So I can assign inspectors with a known, uh, let's say, uh, standard deviation and mean, and I can sample uh, an inspection point from the uncertainty of uh, these inspectors. This would give me some uncertainty uh, about my uh, true state. Now from there, uh, if I want to, so basically the true state represents uh, uh, something called a deterministic uh, estimation of the deterioration state. If I want to take inspection points from the true state, I can have uh, uh, a probabilistic estimate for deterioration state by just eliminating the true state. And then I can use these inspection points, as you see here, to, uh, to predict the deterioration over time. So here I would have my prior estimate, which could be a value depending on the current state of my uh, structure. And then I can, based on the inspections that I sampled, uh, I can uh, predict the uh, deterioration as we've seen using the Kalman filter and uh, also based on a prior estimate for the uh, intervention here I can predict the uh, deterioration moving forward. Now the jump that you're seeing here is really based on a data-driven approach to quantify this jump of intervention so there is no uh, th there's no values that are kind of provided to the framework or being as a guess, but rather most of the ingredients of this framework are data driven and are based on previous uh, studies. But this is kind of an example to show that it is possible to have two types of uh, or two ways to emulate the deterioration behavior, either in a deterministic way, as I've shown here. Or if I want to have a probabilistic way, we can see it here with the Kalman filter estimates based on the inspection data. So this is one aspect uh, in the environment. Now the environment also, of course, uh, is able to model the uh, deterioration speed as uh, a as a co-component with the uh, deterioration condition. Now another aspect we considered in the, when we developed the uh, the uh, environment infra, infra planner is to cap the improvements. So what do I mean by that is that uh, if we have on this uh, simple figure, if we have the time on the x-axis and the condition on the y-axis and we have let's say uh, our true state is going over time and then as I'm going over time and as my structure element is aging, I don't expect an intervention to bring back my my structural element to a perfect state or a new state as my structural element is aging over time. So that's why we have some decay function that would decay the maximum condition of my structural element. So for example if my maximum uh, element condition would be 100 after 50 years it 
there is no intervention other than replacement that would return my uh, co the condition of my structural element to 100. It could return to 90, but it won't return to 100. So this is the idea of capping uh, the effect of repairs over time as the structural element is aging. Uh, another uh, uh, aspect that we consider capping the effect of intervention at is that, again, if we have two consecutive interventions. So here I have the intervention that happened uh, the first time, and then I applied the same action uh, the second time within a very short period of time. So I wouldn't expect the, if I'm applying the same repair uh, within like very short time, I wouldn't expect to have a staircase of improvement, but rather I would expect a slight improvement from uh, the uh, previous repair just like to give uh, a kind of material uh, like an example uh, is to say like okay i painted my uh, structural element uh, uh, the past year and then i came and i painted uh, my structural element like two months after i'm not gonna expect a significant improvement in the uh, in the condition due to uh, painting and that's why this kind of uh, uh, an illustrative example of the idea that they're not going to be a significant improvement from applying the same action twice in consecutive years so this is taken care of within the uh, uh, the uh, infra planner environment now, all these developments along other uh, developments uh, that we have, so uh, in, within this environment where like we can emulate the deterioration process on element level, on uh, a structural category level, as I mentioned earlier, the structural category could be the beams or the slabs or so on, and uh, on a bridge level. Alongside also the possibility to test and compare maintenance policies. So these developments are all encapsulated within a, a gym-based uh, uh, RL uh, environment. So basically, this is a standard uh, uh, standard environment for uh, emulating, or the, the infraplanner is developed in a standard way for emulating the deterioration process. And this uh, environment is available online uh, on GitHub on uh, this link. I will provide a link in the description uh, for this talk. So this uh, environment really provides the foundations for developing or testing decision-making framework, which I'm going to uh, go over in the, uh, uh, in the next section. So just a, a reminder about like what are the main challenges whenever we want to develop or solve uh, maintenance planning problems. The main challenge is, uh, or the main challenges, uh, really mainly related to the scale. So we have hundreds of thousands of elements, structural elements, at, at a given time t. And all these elements, we want to simultaneously make decisions. And again, the decisions could be or include doing nothing. So we need to say, OK, should I do something or not? what kind of maintenance action I should take, and when should I perform the maintenance action. So it's a huge scale given the large amount of uh, elements. The other thing is that I have the stochasticity. So for example, if I have a deterioration model, this uh, deterioration model also have the an, uh, effect of intervention. So both of these are uncertain. So basically, the uncertainty around my uh, deterioration model would have an additional uncertainty about the condition, for example, would have an additional uncertainty after applying the, uh, the maintenance action on the condition as well. So these are the main uh, kind of challenges or components that makes the problem really challenging. So in order to resolve for these uh, for these challenges, uh, what we've looked at is um, I'm going to present some concepts. These concepts are mainly related to hierarchical reinforcement learning. So the first concept is the state abstraction. So what state abstraction means is that if I have the state of reality, so for example, I have here the tree uh, where I have all the details that represent an actual tree in real life. Now, the idea is that 
for me, if I want to assess the health of this tree, I don't need to examine each single leaf within this tree. So I can rely on some form of abstraction to tell me about, like, for example, what's the health uh, of the tree. So basically, I don't need to represent all the leaves to know that what I'm seeing here is a tree and possibly a healthy tree. So this abstraction can be like, as you see in the graph here, or we, it can go as further as like just uh, the mathematical shapes, the basic mathematical shapes of uh, rectangles uh, connected together and differentiated by color. So this is like one aspect about uh, state abstraction. Another concept is really the temporal abstraction. So basically, uh, let's say uh, um, I woke up the next day and I was like, OK, should I stay at home uh, or like go to work? So knowing that staying at home and not telling anyone uh, could affect my my uh, my job or could affect like my career, then I have to decide the long term best decision is actually to go to work. Now, I can describe going to work as in I should leave home at 8.30 and I will be at work at 9. So this is one level of uh, decision making. However, imagine if I want to go further in details to say, OK, which road I should take to go to work. Then I would have something called temporal abstraction where I would have a sub space of where or sub uh, uh, action space where I have to make actions on how should I go to work. So here, for example, the action space would be going up, down, left, right, depending on the road. So for example, here I'm going forward and then uh, going uh, uh, left, right, left, right, and then I would arrive at work. So it's just to illustrate the idea of um, Temporal abstraction, you have two levels or maybe multiple levels of representing the problem. The most abstract level is to do something or not. And then the lower level would be like how you going to do something if you already decided to do it. So you can see like where uh, where I'm going with this is uh, really to take these concepts of uh, uh, hierarchical uh, way of thinking or formulating a problem to take it and apply it on a bridge maintenance uh, problem. So for example, for a bridge, we would have this hierarchy. So I have my bridge and I know I'm going to spend a certain amount of money uh, to maintain this uh, bridge over time following uh, a policy. I call it Pi B. So this policy uh, at, at each certain point in time would tell me I should uh, improve uh, my bridge condition by a certain amount, let's say, and that amount would cost me this uh, certain amount of money. So let's say I decided to maintain uh, my bridge, then I would need to decide which structural category I need to maintain. So that would be also that would cost me a fraction of the money that I allocated for the bridge to allocate for each structural category. And basically, my decision to maintain uh, the bridge would also affect my decision to maintain the category. Because if I said, I don't want to maintain the bridge, I'm not going to maintain anything within this bridge. I'm not going to maintain the categories. So it will affect my policy on the category. And basically, the structural category uh, would do the same thing for the elements. So if I decided to maintain the beams, then I would also have to uh, make the decision from the category on the category of beams. And then I can decide what type of maintenance I need to use to maintain the beams. So maintaining the beams would cost me, let's say in this example, a penny. I'm going to add this to whatever money uh, to get the total amount of money that would cost me to maintain the structure category. And this, eventually, this money would be added from each structure category to get the total amount that is required to maintain a bridge. So basically, this is the main idea of a, a hierarchical uh, maintenance uh, framework. 
where if I want to throw back or go back to the uh, older concepts that I presented, the temporal abstraction happen whenever I'm taking actions on the elements within a certain structural category, while right now I'm only, I have only taken one action, which is to maintain a bridge. But within this one action, I have sub actions that are being performed on the elements of uh, this bridge uh, sequentially. And uh, for the state abstraction is really the way I represent the, uh, uh, the information about the bridge. So for example, I can say, I can think of a state of the bridge, as I mentioned earlier, as the overall condition for the bridge and overall deterioration speed of the bridge. Or I can take uh, a vector that contain the, uh, or that describe the information about the condition, overall condition for the structural categories. So overall condition for the beams, the slabs, and same thing for the speed uh, of each one of them. So this is one way. And another thing is also same thing for the category. How do I represent the state? Should I represent it by the overall condition and speed, or should I represent it by a vector that has the uh, all the uh, components uh, with their condition and their speed, deterioration speed? So all of these uh, are kind of design factors to approach uh, this uh, problem. Now, uh, with that uh, in mind, with all these concepts uh, in mind, we can move on to uh, reinforcement learning, uh, which I hinted about earlier when I introduced the InfraPlanner RL environment. So RL stands for reinforcement learning. And in order to illustrate how reinforcement learning works, imagine you have uh, Super Mario here in this current state, in this frame. If uh, Super Mario in this state decided to jump. So let's see. Uh, obviously, this is a bad decision and it is a bad decision because the game has ended. So and if on the other hand, if Mario, for example, decided to move forward and then jump, you can see that Mario has succeeded in his mission, which is to reach the other side. And this is basically a good decision. Now, the way to tell um, like the computer about whether something is a bad decision or a good decision is basically for a bad decision, you say, I want to give it a minus one. And for a good decision, I want to give it a plus one. So this way I can tell a computer about like, what is, uh, what is my preference? So, uh, uh, in this example, where like we have this uh, video game, the agent or the decision maker is Mario. The environment is Mario World, so we have like all the components where uh, we have like the, all these uh, bricks and uh, uh, the sky and everything is, uh, and even like uh, the uh, the pitfalls here are part of the environment. And the actions could be movement, could be jumping all of that that Marius can take and the objective basically is to win the game. So the end objective in RL is really to learn a policy that maximizes the total expected discounted rewards. So we want to maximize the plus ones and minimize the minus ones as much as possible. So all these principles can be applied on our, our problem, where if, for example, I have, uh, again, the timeline on the X axis here and the condition on the Y axis. Uh, if uh, I have my condition at a given year, 2015, uh, to be around like 85, and then I decided to make an intervention in 2016, decided to replace. So this replacement would result in a condition uh, 100, which is a perfect condition. However, it would cost a lot. Now, on the other hand, if I have uh, the same thing, but instead of replacing, I decided to repair. So exactly the same setup, but except that I did uh, 2016, instead of replacement, I repaired. Then uh, I can see that virtually I have the same outcome. It's just uh, would cost less. So this is 
basically now it is possible for a condition around 85 to be uh, replaced depending on like additional context but this is really a simple example to illustrate the point about how we could formulate the problem so the agent in this context is the decision maker the the person that's responsible for planning the interventions the environment is InfraPlanner, which I introduced earlier, which allows emulating the deterioration process. And the actions would be uh, to do nothing or like to perform routine maintenance or to replace, etc. And the objective uh, basically is to minimize the total expected costs. Now, uh, taking these concepts, uh, if you want to actually perform bridge maintenance, we want to find the maintenance policy for a bridge uh, where this bridge is composed of uh, uh, 15 beams, two front walls, three slabs, guardrails, two guardrails, and uh, uh, four uh, wing walls and three pavement elements. So that's a lot of uh, components given uh, for uh, a, pl a planning problem. Now, uh, to start solving this problem, first we uh, have to look at the uh, uh, we have to start with the structural categories, which is basically let's take an example for the beams, for example. So on this graph that you see here, we have the condition ranging from twenty five, which is the worst condition, up to hundred, which is the best condition. And here for the deterioration speed we have from zero to minus three. So minus three is the worst. So using our L and infra, uh, applied on InfraPlanner to learn a policy for the beams, I can actually learn the policy. So here we have on this part of the condition and speed, we have the action do nothing. This part covers the preventive maintenance for the beam. And this part covers the routine maintenance action. And this part uh, is for the repairs, major repairs, and then for this part is actually the replacement. So this is like what we call a policy map, where I'm showing the decision boundaries on uh, a policy to maintain any beam within uh, my uh, uh, within my given bridge. So uh, taking this and generalizing these ideas for each structural category in my uh, bridge we can see we get these results so this is the beam that i've shown earlier the slabs the front wall pavement wing wall and guardrail now just to note that these are have uh, categorical actions so all these action categories are the same across all these uh, structural categories now if i want to use a hierarchical framework that would actually uh, learn a policy that would tell me okay uh, at what time i should maintain a bridge and then whenever i decide to maintain the bridge which uh, of these uh, categories i should maintain first and then from there i have to decide um, what kind of maintenance action based on each one of these uh, policy maps uh, so for example if i decided to maintain the beams then my maintenance action would be based on this policy map that we are seeing here now there's something i haven't mentioned which is note that we have a red frame around each policy here this red frame de determines what are the uh, bad combination of condition and speed that i want to avoid so in general i don't want to have uh, a, a speed of uh, minus 1.5 and the condition 55 if i reach that point then the agent would receive a penalty so this is like really the uh, main aspects of it if we want to see it in application so we can see here on the x-axis i have the timeline and on the y-axis i have the condition for the overall condition for a bridge uh, on the left and the overall deterioration speed for the bridge on the uh, figure on the right here. So I have my, uh, my inspections, which are the aggregated inspections represented by the blue diamond and the uncertainty around them represented by the blue vertical lines. 
and I have also my deterioration model represented by the red dashed line and the confidence region around it for the condition and the speed. Now, if I initialize my uh, RL environment or the infraplanar environment with the current state of my uh, with the current state of my components, I I take them and I initialize my infraplanar environment. I would uh, uh, my decision making or my hierarchical decision making framework would suggest to follow this policy, which is to maintain at the year 2022 and then maintain again at the year 2029. Now we can see this uh, decision is being reflected also at the same time on the speed. We can see the jumps um, in the condition and the speed as well. And these for the uh, magenta points, uh, squares, they are really an emulated uh, inspections uh, based on the infraplanar environment. Now, if we want to see what the agent specifically or in details uh, suggested, we can look at this graph here. So in this graph, each color refers to a different uh, structural category, as you would see here. And uh, we can see that uh, uh, for uh, for example, here on the x-axis we have the condition, on the y-axis the speed, same thing here, condition and speed. And uh, basically, if I have my the condition of this structure element, for example, the wing wall, is uh, really the lowest and it has a relatively uh, high deterioration speed compared to the other elements. So that's why uh, the agent suggested an immediate maintenance around 2022 and uh, so if I want to display the actions that are performed on these elements so each circle represent a routine maintenance the crosses represent the uh, do nothing and the square represent the replace so here the agent suggested to replace the element with the worst condition and speed at that uh, given year now this is really a summary of the analysis that we've done. We've done comparisons with uh, other frameworks, but this is really the main principles. And uh, the further details are in the paper. I'm going to leave uh, the uh, preprint uh, in the uh, description for this uh, presentation. So uh, to take uh, so what the message or like what's the conclusion of uh, uh, from applying or using uh, reinforcement learning for maintenance planning, the hierarchical approach uh, appears to be a, really a suitable approach for uh, network scale planning or in general large scale planning. This is because we have. Uh, we have the pre-trained policies. So as you see, the policies that we've learned for each structural categories, we can actually leverage some aspects like transfer learning in order to uh, accelerate the learning or maybe possibly uh, 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 like leverage some information from one policy to the other. Uh, the other thing is that uh, interpretability, because of the uh, large scale problem and because of the uh, no presence of clear stopping criteria, because at the end, uh, the planning problem normally is uh, uh, modeled as an infinite uh, horizon uh, planning problem. So in general, there is no clear stopping criteria as the number of times that the agent succeeded or uh, in achieving the task. So it's really hard to assess the performance of the policy or assess the reward function. So that's why plotting the decision boundaries are, is really important and which gives uh, better interpretability uh, to the approach. Now, the other point I want to mention is that, and like one of the key conclusions here is that reinforcement learning is not perfect. It's really uh, uh, in the early stages, It's it, it looks good on benchmarks, our well-designed experiments, but uh, there are a lot of uh, hidden uh, pieces about like uh, whether the reward, how do you define the reward function, is, is the reward function is good, is your policy is good. So that's why it's better to give it a partial control where uh, you can actually, uh, uh, in this partial control, you can 
give some part uh, of the control to the supervised learning. So for example, uh, you can uh, leverage uh, supervised learning to learn from uh, previous or past policies for making decisions. And uh, for sure, you would need uh, decision verification systems in the sense that it's not necessarily that if uh, the agent suggests to maintain, it means that a maintenance is required. So this uh, all for this uh, presentation. And for sure, there are more details in the paper.